Tara. Hi. Today, we're going to continue on our road trip with the flowers to earn the final part of our journey, the Clover Award. Are you ready? Yes. Chapter 5, Toward the Coast of California. With the pines of Arizona behind them, the flowers traveled south and west into the desert. They talked about all the pinions they had seen, pinion pines, pinion nuts, and pinion jays. I love the smell of pine trees, Lupe said. It's good that they're growing again, said Clover, but I'm still worried about my cousin in Alaska. Alaska, here we come, cried Sunny. First, we're going, to, going west to the coast of California, Lupe reminded her friend. And before that, we have to cross this hot desert, Zinni said. The flowers gazed at the flat, sandy land all around them. Brown mountains in the distance looked like bare rock. As they traveled along, spindly plants tumbled all around them. One even tumbled right into the side of the pedal power car and stuck to it. Hi, I'm Tatiana the tumbleweed, the plant said. A real live tumbleweed, asked Clover. Wow, we really are out west. I'm not from here, said Tatiana. Well, I grew up here on a tumbleweed farm, but my family is from Russia. They came to America when they were just seeds. They hopped into a bag of flaxseed by accident and landed in North Dakota. From Russia to North Dakota, that's pretty far traveling for a seed, said Zinni. Right now, she was trying her best to hang on to her own seeds in the hot, blustery wind. That's nothing, said Tatiana. We've since tumbled north to Canada and south to Mexico. Just then a gust of wind blew Tatiana off the pedal power car. She tumbled onto the road and into the desert brush. Bye, Tatiana, the flowers called out as their car kept moving on. Soon they were in California, driving past the tall date trees of a town called Indio. How about we stop for some date shakes, Zinni asked. Sounds like a nice cool treat to me, said Clover. You know, our pal Daisy likes to drink hot tea on hot days. Why is that, I wonder? As the flowers sipped their shakes, a big white truck pulled in next to them. Dairyland was painted on its side. Look, called out Zinni, the Dairyland truck. Let's say hi to Jazz. Yoo-hoo! Anybody home, Sunny called. Jazz peeked out the back and said hello. So let's try to make some date shakes, just like the ones that our flower friends had. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Let's our get blender. started. We are going to put in one cup of, of vanilla ice cream. Do you want to put this in? Yes. There you go. That's a big mm -hmm. drop. And then we've got one half cup, not one cup, it's one half cup of dates. And this is date paste. I might need to scrape that with the scraper to get it out. So this is what we've used. It's baking dates, and they are dates that have already been pitted and ground to a paste. You could use whole dates, but you will have to pit them and chop them and then grind them up before you use them <laughs> in your shape. Okay. And then we're going to add a half a cup of milk. All right, are you ready? Here's half a cup of milk. All right, now we're going to put our lid on. Now we have to mix it up. And we're going to blend it. All right, I think it's ready. You want to pour it? Yes. I want to pour it. Pour we have it. our very cool Olaf glass to put it in. It's my favorite. It's my favorite glass to put smoothies You're gonna pour? in. Yep. Taste. Mm-hmm. A blast of cool air came out of the truck, too. Wow, that cool air feels so nice, Lupe said. Can we come inside? Fine by me, said Jazz. This is a refrigerator truck, 
truck full of cheese. That's why it's so cool inside. But cheese isn't much fun to travel with. It can't talk. So come on in. I could use some company besides my own sweet-smelling flowers. Your flowers smell really good, said Clover. We've just come from the pinion pines of Arizona. They smell good, too. They're growing again after nearly being wiped out by a fungus. Sounds just like the chestnut trees back home in Florida, Jazz said. That's a good comeback story, too. Have you heard it? More than 100 years ago, chestnut trees grew all along the East Coast from Maine to Georgia. They also grew west to the Mississippi. Chestnuts were important food for people and animals, and chestnut wood was used for many things. Then a fungus attacked the trees and most of them died. But in Ohio, one big tree lived. That tree helped grow new trees. Those new trees now live on a chestnut tree farm in Florida. By the time Jazz finished telling the flower friends all about the chestnut trees, they had reached the coast of California. It was time to say goodbye. Lupe drove her car out of the Dairyland truck. She and her friends were ready for a nice long rest in the beach cottages of Crystal Cove. After that, they would head north to find yellow lupine in the sand dunes of Humboldt Bay. So Crystal Cove is a beautiful state park in California. And we have a lot of state and national parks here in Virginia too, and national parks all over the country. And it is our job as scouts and as responsible people, it's our job to make sure that we keep these, these parks safe and we protect all of the wildlife, the plants and animals, so that lots of people can enjoy them in the future, right? So one of the best ways that we have to do our part and protect the, the parks is to, to use the seven principles of leave no trace. Do you remember what leave no trace is? Yes. The seven principles of leave no trace. Number one, know before you go. That means to plan ahead and prepare for your trip. Number two, know your path. That means to use established campsites and trails when available and set up your campsite at least 200 feet from water. Number three, trash your trash. That means to dispose of all trash and waste properly. If you bring it in, you bring it out. Number four, leave what you find, plants and animals. Don't damage things, don't deface things, don't remove things. Leave all of those beautiful flowers right where they are so others can enjoy them. Number five, be careful with fire. Use a stove or a fire ring. Never build a fire in the middle of the woods. Number six, respect wildlife. Keep your distance and remember, wild is wild. They are not pets. Don't feed them and do not approach them. Be considerate of others is number seven. Be kind to your fellow campers and hikers and be kind to all of the wildlife. A fun way to practice the seven, the seven ways to leave no trace. Number one. Know before you go. Number two, find your path. Number three, trash your trash. Number four, leave what you find, plants and animals. Number five, be careful with fire. Number six, if you can cover it, you're far enough away. Number seven, be kind, peace sign, and high five. Chapter six, North to White Sweet Clover. From high on a sunny cliff, the flower friends looked down on the shimmering Pacific Ocean. Waves rolled in one after another, leaving a line of white, foamy water between the sand and the sea. Up above, seagulls dipped and soared on the wind. This was Half Moon Bay, a place as lovely as its name. I could sit here forever, Lupe said. But shouldn't we get going, asked Clover. It's a long way to Alaska, and we want to stop to see Yellow Lupine first. By now, Rosie the Rose had joined the flower friends. She always spends the summer in California, 
Like Zinni, she loves the dry California air. It's good for her petals. Fine by me, Rosie said. The sooner we get going, the sooner we can reach Clover's cousin and make the world a better place. And so the flowers headed north. They passed through parklands of giant redwood trees where clusters of ladybugs dozed in the shade. The tree's thick reddish-brown bark was like no other tree the flowers had ever seen. Redwoods are the world's tallest trees, but their cones are small. They're the size of a grape or an olive. Each one can hold 100 seeds. By the time they reached the sand dunes of Humboldt Bay, yellow lupine was nowhere to be seen. I'm so sorry, Lupe said to Clover. I thought yellow lupine would still be here. I wanted you to meet her. I guess she's back home in Southern California where she can really help the dunes. On to Alaska then, said Sunny. I want to see a moose. Let's hurry, said Clover. I don't want to miss white sweet clover too. Traveling as far as they could by the light of day, the flowers drove north, north, north. Soon they were in Oregon along the Columbia River Gorge. They stopped by a beautiful waterfall. This is salmon country, said Lupe. Millions of wild salmon once swam the rivers here. People promised to protect them forever. They need to work harder to keep that promise. North, north, north of the flowers went. When the road became rocky and rough, they talked of taking a ferry or even a plane. You know, Lupe, said Clover, I've heard that you can see lots of shapes and colors from an airplane. I've heard that from the sky, the land looks just like a patchwork quilt. That would be fun to see someday, said Lupe, but let's stay on the ground for now. This pedal power car has served us well. Let's keep using it. Along the way, the flowers picked up Tula the tulip. She was visiting friends in the tulip fields of Washington State. Tula always tried to be courageous and strong. Tula, said Clover, when I talk to my cousin, I'm going to need some of your courage and strength. The Skagit Valley Tulip Festival in Washington State was started by farmer George Gibbs. In 1892, he planted tulips to bring beauty to the gloomy, rainy Northwest. People loved the tulips so much that he was able to get the U.S. Department of Agriculture to help him import 15,000 tulip bulbs from Holland. The first festival opened in 1920. It is now a 30-day celebration every spring, bringing beauty and happiness to make the world a better place. Let's start with a square piece of paper. Fold on the diagonal to make a triangle, then lay flat again. Fold on the opposite diagonal to make another triangle, and fold flat again. Now fold uh, side by side, and then fold up and down. You will now have a star shape in the middle of your paper. Now you're going to tuck in the sides of your star shape and fold them down to make a triangle shape. Take one edge of your triangle bottom and fold it up towards the top point of your triangle. Repeat with the other side, then flip it over and repeat with the other two sides. You will now have a diamond shape. Take one side of your diamond shape and flip it over to the other side. You will now have three sections on one side and one section on the other. You're going to take the, the bottom section and flip it over so that you have two and two. Take the corner of your diamond and fold it in towards the center. Do the same with the other side of the diamond on the other corner. Fold it in towards the center and lay them flat. Flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. We're going to turn our kite shape over so that the small point is on top and the long large point is on the bottom. Our folds have created pockets on the sides. We're going to tuck one side into the pocket on, and then flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. You should now have what looks like two triangular shaped cups if you look at it from the top and there's a hole in the top as well. While holding the sides together, blow into the hole that's on the top. This will inflate your shape. Turn your shape over so the rounded portion is on the bottom and the point is at the top. Gently fold down the paper edges from the point down to make petals. Start with a green square of paper. 
fold it on the diagonal, then unfold it and turn it to form a diamond shape. Take one corner of your diamond shape and fold it in towards the center from the top. Repeat with the other side. Now fold your bottom corners up toward the middle on both sides. Once again, you're going to fold in from the top the corners in towards the center on both sides. Now bring the two points to meet together by folding our, our shape in half. Holding our shape with the points facing up, gently fold it in half down the middle. Crease firmly and then gently pull out the smaller point. Insert the large point of our leaves into the bottom hole of our flower head. Push down gently. And now you have a beautiful tulip to brighten your day. And so the flowers traveled on, north, north, north. After what seemed like days and days, they reached Alaska. Right away they saw sweet white sweet clover. She and her family were scattered all over the land. They were even camped in the wildest parts of the wilderness. I'm so glad I found you, white sweet clover, Clover said. You don't look like me at all. You're so tall and scraggly. But deep down, you are my cousin, that's for sure. Underneath all your wild ways, you're really very sweet. That's why I don't like hearing about you causing trouble here in Alaska. Come back south where clover grows in fields and pastures without troubling anyone or anything. White sweet clover frowned. Clover could see that her cousin needed to hear more. We clover have so much to offer, she said. Look at me. I give a nice green carpet to our garden, and I give nectar to honey the honeybee. If you move south, you too can use your resources wisely. And you'll be making the world a better place, Rosie said. But I love Alaska, white sweet clover said. I love the moose and all the snow in winter, and I love the long summer days filled with light. I want to stay, but clover would not give up. You're stopping good plants from growing, she said. Those plants are food for the moose you love. She asked White Sweet Clover to gather her family by the river to talk it over. And talk they did. They talked and talked and talked. Then they all agreed. They would move south before the first snowfall. Clover now felt her trip to Alaska was a success. We've learned so much about plants and seeds and where they do good and where they do harm, she said. We know enough to help plants everywhere. Let's head home. But we haven't seen a moose, Sunny said. A photo of us with a moose would make the best postcard of all. And so the flower friends piled back into Lupe's pedal power car and went where they loved to be, outdoors between earth and sky, in the sun and fresh air, on the lookout for something new to see. So let's get started building our birdhouse. Today we are going to use this birdhouse kit and it is available to buy on Amazon or at craft stores like Michael's or Hobby Lobby or you could even buy it at um, scout shops. This kit comes with all of the uh, wood pieces pre-cut and it also comes with this little package of nails. We have found however that the nails are very difficult to use without splitting the wood. And um, we've also noticed that the kits have an unreliable number of nails. Um, some have fewer than others, and you don't have enough to finish the kit. So today, we will not be using the nails. If you do want to use the nails for your birdhouse, I would highly recommend pre-drilling the holes first. So today, we have our pre-cut pieces of wood and we went ahead and spray painted all of them and let them dry overnight so they are ready to go. And these are all of our wood pieces here. We will also need tape. We're using painter's tape. You could also use masking tape, but I would not recommend using clear packing tape because it could remove the paint finish on your birdhouse. We will also need some string and scissors to cut our string, wood glue, um, a ruler and I would also recommend this isn't necessary but I would recommend having it this is clear silicone caulk um, you can buy it at in you know, Target Walmart anywhere like that and this is um, the waterproof stuff that you would use for bathrooms so we're gonna move our stuff out of our way here 
And let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is take a look at all of our pieces. So we have a long, narrow, rectangle piece, this one. This will be the bottom. There's only one because it's the four mm -hmm. where the birds can so that get That goes in. right on the bottom. And then we have two small rectangles. There's two of mm -hmm. each one. Right, the small rectangles are the sides of the birdhouse. And then the large rectangles will be the roof of the birdhouse. Just like that. And then we have two almost diamond-shaped pieces. The one with the hole in the front will be the front, and the one without the hole is the back. So it'll kind of go, oh, kind of go more like this, so that the bird has a little platform to sit on. And the flat portion, this flat portion is what goes, attaches to the bottom plank of the birdhouse. All right. So we are going to start with our bottom plank piece. Make sure we, everybody can see that. Okay. And we're going to put it down flat on the on a table or surface. And then we're going to take our two side pieces. And we're going to put our side pieces lined up with the back portion of the floor plank. Good job. And now we're going to get some tape ready. So first, we're going to get a piece of tape about that big, and we're going to put it right across, right across the, the planks to hold them all together. There you go. Then we're going to get another little piece of tape and we're going to kind of cut it in half so you have narrow two narrow strips and with the sticky side facing up you're going to put one there and put one under the other side there you go make sure they're stuck on there good so this is what we this is what it looks like what we have right now I don't know if you can see that. Now we are going to get the front of our birdhouse. Which piece is the front of our birdhouse? It's um when we do the back piece, it has to look like a diamond like this. Mm -hmm, but right now we're doing the front of our birdhouse. So it, it has to look like this. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we're gonna do. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is put a line of glue across this edge. Let, let, let me show them. Across this edge right here. We're going to put a line of glue. Okay. Not much in this spot. It might be hard to come out. Hold on. Squeeze hard. Okay, so we have our glue all the way across there. Right? We're going to line that up. Good job. Yep, and pick that up. And then we're going to flip our tape up. Hang on. Don't go too fast. We're going to flip our tape up to hold it in place. And then we line up the other side and flip the tape up to hold it in place. Okay, and now we are going to set this aside to dry until tomorrow. Molly. Okay. We're going to set it so that if we keep messing with it and touching it, then the glue won't, won't dry and it'll set uneven. So once we have it all taped, we set it aside to dry. So now we're going to take our two 
pieces of roof, right? Our two big rectangles for the roof. And we are going to take our ruler. <clears throat> And we are going to measure out eight inches of string. So can you measure where would be eight inches of string? To right there? Mm-hmm. Okay. There we go. Eight inches of string. So now again, we're going to take some of our tape and we're going to tear it in half to make two narrow pieces. So the first end of our string, we're going to put on the back portion of one of our roof pieces. So we're going to lay it down and tape it just like that, right? I'm going to move your fingers out of the way so we can tape it. Yep, just like that. And now we're going to measure two inches because we want our string to be two inches apart, right? So where is the two inches? Can you put your finger and put your finger on, down on the pink part? Right there, good. And now we know where to put our second string. Be right there. Here's the tape, and tape that down. Okay. Now, we want to make sure that the string faces in towards the other piece, and it's gonna go underneath. So we're gonna put this new piece of wood on top of our string. Because when the birdhouse is done like this, we want to make sure the string is on the outside to hang it, right? Yes, because we need to hang it on the branch. Mm -hmm. And I just realized we're going to have to move our tape a little bit for our glue. We made our piece of tape a little too long. Go. So we'll just do like that. And now we have a little hanger here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to put our two pieces together like that. Now our back piece, right? Now Molly was talking about it earlier that for the back piece, because this is now the roof, so our piece is upside down. So what do we have to do with our roof piece? We, we have to put it shaped like a diamond. Mm-hmm. That's right. So where do we put the glue? Across. I think we're going to put the glue on our two point edges. Right? Because we're going to lay it down on top of our roof piece. This time instead of if you want to do it, you can't do it. Only grown-ups. You want to get glue all over the place. Well, so we're grown-ups. Our bottle is just hard to use. Alright. So we have our glue on our pieces. And, oh, you know what we forgot? We forgot our other tape. Can you hold this? We forgot the rest of our tape. So we want to do just like what we did on the front of the house. We're going to put tape underneath like that and tape underneath like that so that it can hold our pieces in place. All right. Okay. So now, right, line it up and lay it down and flip your tape up to hold it. There you go, you got it.
flip the tape up to hold it just like that. Alright, so we are going to let this set to dry overnight and then when we come back we can take all of our tape off and we'll put our top onto our bottom or our roof onto our our bottom portion and we can decorate it okay yes and when tomorrow it'll be like puzzle pieces once you take the tape off yeah a little bit it'll be like a puzzle piece okay okay so we are back and our glue has dried on our two pieces we have removed all of the blue tape from our birdhouse pieces and now we're going to glue the top and the bottom and I think we also forgot to um, to glue down our strings on the inside of the roof so you want to make sure you put some glue there to glue down the strings and make sure they stay in place so what we're going to do is we're going to put glue all along these edges and all across the bottom and out. We're running out of glue here. We had started to do this earlier and we had a little bit of difficulty with our video so we're trying to redo it to show you. But put some glue along the sides there. And then we're going to put our top on our bottom just like that. You want to make sure that they're lined up just like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like I said, we had done this earlier and we had to kind of redo it because our video wasn't working. And then what are we going to do? We are going to we are going to seal the top on. Mm -hmm. So we're taking our screws off. We're taking our clear silicone um, caulking, and we've already got plenty on there, so we don't need any more. We're just pretending here because we already did the top earlier. So you're going to put a bead of caulk down the top roof line, and you're going to just kind of use your finger to smooth it out. And the reason you want that is you want to seal up the roof line um, to prevent rainwater from getting in. However, you do not want to, you don't want to seal the bottom because they need this bottom area for drainage. So you want to keep that open and unsealed. So once all the glue and everything is dry on this, you can take some markers or paint or something and decorate it however you want. And if you're going to do that, I would do a clear coat of polyurethane or something over it. You can even get the spray stuff. Now, this is a very small birdhouse. So the kinds of birds that would use this to build their nests would be small birds like chickadees or bluebirds. And those two kinds of birds are native to Virginia where we live. And they are small birds. Now, typically they would want um, a color house that would be camouflaged so earth tones browns and greens um, so that it would blend in with their surroundings right we kind of went the pretty route and we did pink and purple but typically the birds would like more earthy camouflage tones and for um, for chickadees and bluebirds you're going to want to hang this little house on a tree branch about six feet off the ground because they like to be a little bit higher so that predators won't be able to get into their nests and you don't fill it with bird seed because the birds will come and they will build their nest inside right they like to be in the trees or shrubs um, kind of they like to feel kind of surrounded by the trees and shrubs but you want to make sure they're near an open um, grassy area where they can get worms and bugs to eat and to feed their young because if they do make a nest in there they will have eggs and they will have babies in there. 
So right now, we are going to listen to some sounds of what chickadees and bluebirds sound like and um, look at some pictures of what they look like so that you can listen and look in your own backyard to see if you have them there. That way you know that if you put a house out, you'll probably have some birds that want to come and use it. Now these are native birds to Virginia and to most of the northeastern United States. And it is very important for us to to support and help our native wildlife. That's what we learned in our story, that native plants and, and animals need, um, need places to live and places to eat. And we want to make sure that we help them and not the invasive species like the yellow lupine and the white sweet clover. And we actually have an invasive species here in Virginia called garlic mustard. That's another plant that we, we pull up. Um, and we throw it away because it's invasive and it kills out all of the other native plants to our area. So right now let's take a listen to what chickadees and bluebirds sound like and look like. You ready? Congratulations, Girl Scouts. You have earned the final badge. The, the Clover Badge. You, you have completed your journey. Now let's put the, our badge together. Once we put it together, it will go on the pocket, right here, the pocket of your Daisy Vest. Thank you for joining us on this journey. It's been a lot of fun. Bye. Bye, Girl Scout.